on uh, mobile health and uh, uh, health care reform. Uh, my name is AJ Chen, I'm from the uh, Active Street Peer startup that, that I just started a few months ago. Um, so, and, and, and the format uh, of this panel will be very straightforward. I would uh, uh, introduce you know, briefly every panelist and then let them, and then let them to uh, introduce themselves for about three minutes and to give us more, feet, uh, more background about their company and what they are doing. And then uh, I will ask a few general questions. They open up to, uh, up to the floor for, for your questions. I think the uh, amazing thing about the discussions, I hope that we can get uh, the audience to really participate in the discussion. And, and uh, before I introduce uh, the panelists, uh, uh, I want to, uh, to, to get a sense of how many people are actually working in or related to the, to the healthcare uh, field. Please raise your hand. I've got a few. Uh, but certainly it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, a, you know, only a small portion of it. So in that one of the we're going to address, uh, to address today as well. Um, let me start with the, uh, uh, the parents on my... Yeah, yeah. You, uh, Yu um, you, you is, a, is, is from, uh, from uh, uh, Cisco. Uh, he's a senior director of the corporate affairs uh, for the Global Healthcare Corporate Social Responsibility Program. And uh, I'll let uh, uh, you just introduce a little bit more about uh, this work. Great, thanks, AJ. So my name is Yui, I'm working in Cisco. I joined Cisco about five years ago. Uh, that time, there was a space happening in China, West part of China, about 80,000 people uh, casualty. And they were, John Chambers was really kind enough to say, can we do something together with the Chinese government? So he decided to put aside $45 million to help people the building focus on the education and healthcare side. So I joined, I was recruited to manage the healthcare portion of that. So the idea was really, and the government is putting so much on the facility infrastructure, can we use some of the technology, including the M-House or E-House, really to help the capacity building, but also building for the long sustainability. So I've been work, working in Cisco for five years, I just relocated to uh, San Jose area about a year ago. So my current role is really based on that I'm leading the similar program globally for Cisco. So we have program uh, in Brazil, Patrick, Dr. Kennedy. We have program in Brazil, in Jordan, in Kenya. Really the same idea, how can we use the technology really to help the provider patients to get a better care a global sense. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's amazing that uh, Cisco, such a large company, uh, uh, who have, has done you know uh, the, the you know infrastructure around the world, and is actually contributing to, into the uh, uh, very now major role in healthcare. That, that's fantastic. And uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Michelle. Um, Michelle is uh, from uh, Durham Tech, and and she she's a uh, resident physician at, at uh, Stanford. Uh, medical school, and uh, uh, she's focused on uh, moving uh, technology from bench to to the real world, and uh, that that's very really important because uh, Sam has a uh, whole lots of uh, technology uh, in the uh, probably under the bench. Uh, let uh, let uh, Michelle to review that for us. Sure. So my name is Michelle Lemire. I'm training in dermatology, and I'm actually working in I'm very interested in machine learning, and I use my mobile device um, as a tool in healthcare every day. And what I'm working on are methods whereby I can essentially teach a system to think like myself, so we can extend that knowledge to providers who are not trained in the same domain. So DermTap is um, our first innovation, our first product, and it essentially enables compliant image sharing between experts where you're pairing a diagnosis with every image um, and then we're extending beyond that to be able to tie that with patient data um, you know and I think that what I, I guess what I find to be most inspiring about mobile health generally is just the opportunity it affords 
to extend health care to populations that may not otherwise reach it, and also to really scale physician expert expertise and knowledge to providers who may not have that same subset of knowledge. That's it, Michelle. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Sean. Sean is from Kaiser Permanente, and uh, he's the director of innovation. Uh, and uh, Sean is focused on identifying very uh, new emerging technology that uh, have the potential to you know, advance Kaiser. Uh, I think probably not just Kaiser, probably uh, uh, the whole healthcare as well. Uh, but I'll let Sean to tell us more. Good morning, I'm Sean Kaiser. Uh, Pleasure to be here today and yeah, connecting with all the innovators. So I represent Kaiser Permanente, and as most of you know, we're uh, nonprofit integrated healthcare providers, currently serving about 9.1 million members uh, across eight states plus uh, Washington D.C. So my responsibility and really my passion uh, within Kaiser Permanente is to help the organization identify, um, assess and operationalize new and emerging technology that we think has the ability to enhance, um, you know, enhance the quality and affordability of our care. So within Kaiser Permanente, we have a stage A based uh, innovation life cycle and process. And generally, this life cycle begins with the concept of initiation, initiating, meeting with uh, innovators like yourself, identifying new technology, speaking to VCs and other vendors, to identify their technologies. And then what we do is shepherd those ideas across the innovation life cycle. The second stage is the idea of ideation, where we let our ideas collide with uh, those of our commissions, our architects, our technologists, so then they germinate into a set of recommendations and ideas. Ultimately, we want to see those gadgets and technology transform into integrated healthcare solutions. In, uh, in the context of mobile uh, and mobile health, I think I'm personally very excited about mobile technology's ability to um, really change the, the, the healthcare paradigm. Today, most of us probably have a more episodic relationship with our physicians. We may, be see, we may see them two, three, four times a year. But think about the relationship you have with your mobile devices. Most of you probably don't leave home without it. So imagine now having the ability using these mobile devices to collect information about you, your family members, in your, uh, in your environments, and how to integrate those wellness data with the clinical information to come up with a more comprehensive, uh, preventive health dose. So looking forward to uh, ideating with uh, the crowd here today and also the panelists, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to see how we can all work together to shape the future of health care. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, next, uh, Ben is from the Cloud, um, as, as, as she's an um, entrepreneur and studied uh, Cloud a couple of years ago and I met her actually uh, on a couple of other events before. Um, and uh, she has uh, been really pushing uh, mobile, uh, particularly text messaging type of technology into the understood population, the certain understood population. So, uh, Bing, could you tell us more about that? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hear me? Better? Uh, hi, my name is Bing, uh, founder and CEO of Health We are a uh, seed-funded uh, startup out here in uh, San Mateo. And uh, what we are is a global patient relationship management platform. So we don't develop applications, but rather we're leveraging the ubiquity of text messaging Thank you. 
of our customers primarily today are what we call Medicaid and Medicaid organizations, um, your you know, health insurance that insure our country's Medicaid beneficiaries. And the wonderful thing about the expansion is that it's so ubiquitous. So populations that otherwise you know, would have trouble accessing um, you know, health resources or care are not, we're not able to engage continuously in our using our technology platform. Um, I have a lot of perspectives to share from privacy to Obamacare to uh, I'm sure you guys have a lot of topics in mind. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, uh, you know, discussing you guys on these uh, exciting topics. Thank you, Jay. Next book uh, is uh, Bill Kennedy. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill is the Chief of the uh, Pediatric Urology at the uh, Lucy Parker Ch uh, Children's Hospital. And uh, he's working on and also probably uh, using the fantastic telehealth uh, uh, devices or, or setup. And uh, Bill, please uh, tell us more about your, your exciting work. Sure. Um, I'm Bill Kennedy. I'm a faculty member of Stanford Medical School and actually here today as the physician champion for our telehealth program. And a physician champion is, is a person who's crazy enough to take on a problem within the hospital system that's the thought is um, foreign and unbeautiful. And uh, it's something that we try to slow down within the medical communities. Um, and what we've done actually is to leverage the fact that Packard has the greatest number of physician specialists for children's care in all the all of Northern California, yet the pediatric population is spread throughout the entire state, and oftentimes fall from the sites where the pediatric specialists like to practice. So we've actually opened up telehealth sites, one in Monterey, one up in San Francisco, and we actually do the entire physician interaction from history taking down to physical exam, remotely through the web, um, and actually you have taken it wireless. Uh, I'm traveling to the Silver Hill Clinics from other cities, say like New Orleans, and back to San Francisco, and have them already, so that the patients aren't missing their set appointments. Um, it's been extraordinarily well received by the pediatric population and their parents, and we've got a full sort of research program behind it, collecting metrics, collecting information on the payers, the opportunity costs that we save the parents by not having to travel. Um, it sounds like a crazy concept when you first think of it. Uh, we really engage the population with it, and the physicians who are the naysayers are now all lined up, ready to come on board after we've had our pilot running since February to August. We've seen roughly 200 patients. But maybe as kind of a little tease, since I can't show a patient interaction because of all the HIPAA compliance, we do have a short video, maybe about a minute, from our training session where you get a sense of how the technology works, how the physicians can interact with patients, and even how the physical exam characteristics can travel back and forth. Um, I'm a pediatric neurologist and a regenerative urinary reconstructive surgery, so pretty sensitive. Yet my parent, my parents and patients will bear all on television cameras um, to give me the information that I need to make decisions. And there's sometimes only the day of surgery will actually meet people for the first time at Packard Children's Hospital. So the authenticity of the interactions can be extraordinarily great. If a parent is going to trust a surgeon with their child, that would be never going to be that person. Maybe with that, I can find a video and a feature for about 30 seconds or so. Uh, 
where actually has the meaning is and what is actually happening. <laughs> hey, you're still talking about me, though. <laughs> So it's great that, that we have we have a provider, we have uh, entrepreneurs, we have startup company, we have uh, the, you know people uh, dealing with new technology, big uh, uh, care organizations, and big uh, big companies. So I, really, I think we have uh, we have really have a, a great mix of people uh, to to discuss uh, this uh, very important uh, field. And hope that you will join us to to, uh, to uh, answer a lot of questions at the end uh, in the second half. Now, uh, before I uh, add the start or ask ask the general questions, I want to just give you a little uh, update on the uh, uh, on, on some of the work currently going on at the uh, at that HHS, the U.S. Department of Health, particularly on, in terms of the. Uh, um, the healthcare uh, or the medical use program and also the standard and policies. And that would, that would because it's really, really uh, directly related to what we're talking about today. So, as I am uh, uh, participating or involving in the Federal Advisory Committee on the uh, uh, Health IT Standards, I started to see very clearly that there are two really there are, there are almost two worlds uh, in the healthcare right now in terms of technology. Where one is you've got the providers, uh, which is primarily uh, use all the EHR technology and everything around it. And then you have a very vibrant, uh, dynamic uh, health consumer health IT uh, sectors are trying to build uh, new, uh, new ways to, to help uh, uh, consumers, uh, which are patients. Everyone, it, Almost is a patient, uh, but the the uh, the link between between the consumer uh, applications, devices, and the providers, uh, uh, what's used by the providers, meaning in particular EHRs, is really a missing link, and, and that's a that's a very important thing that's going on now. Is is that how do we connect the the uh, consumer tools with providers EHR and get a data going back and forth. And, and, and this is under, under the whole uh, health, I, health information exchange uh, category, and which is part of, which is uh, right now is one of the major focus at, at HHS. Uh, so we, I think you will get uh, uh, our uh, federal advisory committee. What we are, what we are focusing now is really to look at all the standards that that are that are have been. Uh, proposed and used before about the healthy information change and also look at the new standards that may make it more easier because it's actually not trivial and not easy to, to, to really connect, say, for example, your your uh, mobile application on your phone to uh, 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 you know, to package hospitals and get data from, you know, build uh, a hospital's EHR, so that's very difficult. Um, but that, that's something that we have to solve, and I think, I think uh, HHS is really putting a lot of efforts in, in this. And, and particularly, uh, so we probably will see, see uh, you probably will see new, new standards or new recommendations from, uh, from HHS uh, that about how to, uh, how to pull the data from EHR into any, any tool that you are developing. But uh, in addition, you, 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 I think it would be, it would be good that you, you, can actually, you, you can start actually thinking about the other side of the coin, which is getting data into EHR, because that will actually open up a, a new probably a new door for a lot of opportunities. Uh, because, because particularly, getting data into EHR is not really it's not something that's done very regularly. Uh, and, and that and, and, and that really requires because because, because really the, the EHR most of the time are very uh, low quality or uh, 
And but in the future, uh, you you probably will see very 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 soon that we uh, the, uh, the the committees, the uh, policy committees as well as the standards committees, will, will probably propose or make recommendations to the Secretary of Health about uh, regulations on uh, how to facilitate this type of moving uh, 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 data from patient tools to EHR. And, and, and currently we have a new term called patient generated uh, health data, PGHD. And so we're working on really on how to, how to make the PGHD, uh, uh, meaning the patient generated uh, health data uh, into EHR so that the physicians can actually also have the data from, uh, uh, from the, for the patients who actually uh, in the future probably do more uh, with, the, with the tools and generate a lot of data that could be very useful for the physicians, uh, 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 physicians, physician. Uh, so with that, uh, as, a, as a background, uh, let me start uh, asking this, uh, in fact, very, very, uh, you know, the, uh, the very important question about this connection between between the EHR and, and, and the patient tools. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, each parents can give us some some uh, maybe you know experience or, or a story that that that's related to this interaction between your uh, the patient tools and and, and providers uh, EHR. Okay, that's really a good question, also a challenging question. So maybe some some of those things we got chance to work in different country. Right? The many things maybe technology wise US is very advanced, but in the sense of adoption for the Alaska, maybe we also example we can look at from other countries. I just use one example. We recently been working in Brazil. Brazil is a big country, three hundred million people and the health system quite different from here because the public health delivery is free for every city. They take this as human rights. One way they develop an interesting idea is they call the family health program. Really focus on the primary primary care rather than on the tertiary care. So they, they design a model easy to understand. Every 4,500 population, they have a one team, one doctor, one nurse, one technician. So this one team responsible for this 4,500 people. And the traditional this team has been really mobile going to your home, looking at all the aspects of health care. So when we try to see how can we include their efficiency, their issue, how can we provide a tool, allow them to manage this 4,500 people uh, being efficient. I, I think the question to your question is that electronic health record or patient record become essential. So what we find out is actually not directly the patient record connecting to the EHR from the tertiary hospital, but can we use this family health program for this primary care doctor as an intermediary? So can you use them to bridge between the individual patient and the tertiary doctors? So this could be some way we can, we are speaking the process of linking that we provide an easy enough mobility-based uh, tools and this tool can also link it back to the hospital information system or EMR. Then they can also use this to inter interact with those patients individually. So I think that could be one of the models we could look at. Yeah, yes. well, so certainly in that kind of setting, uh, the connection is very important. Shall we Sure. So this question is very near and dear to my heart. Um, simply because I think there's so much talk about digital health, but as a doctor, aside from the EHR, it hasn't actually really changed my practice until we started to look at how can we actually make patient data that's on mobile and that connectivity with providers, which was our first use case in dermatology, and provide that information in a meaningful way to the EHR and it could be utilized down the road as a true record. And so actually we partnered with HHS on this pressure ulcer application development. And our goal was to streamline the ability to evaluate and treat pressure ulcers. And by doing that, we actually um, worked with the Sonoma and HL7 requirements for what the data standardization will be. And it was actually a incredible learning process for an OS2 
startup that really defined how we saw what we were doing, and that was our first application was simply for neurology, but we saw a much bigger opportunity, which was essentially taking what we had done on mobile device for encryption, what we were doing on our back end with the data standardization, and also making that data interoperable. So Neurotap itself actually sits on the platform that's been developed by my co-founders who are sales force and other enterprise developers who have really architected this with the idea of data interoperability in mind. And I totally agree with you. I think that's a differentiator at this point in technology. And I think that that type of interoperability will be essential to doctors and patients actually connecting in ways we already kind of do. I text message my patients. But making that clinically relevant and seamless from a true medical legal liability standpoint so that it can be a part of that patient's record and that all of that interaction and patient care can be documented in the proper way. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great direction for you to check the work site to do that. Great. Uh, looking past for a I think we have the privilege as well as the challenge of managing uh, the world's largest Civilian-based electronic health records. Uh, Civilian-based because the federal government actually has the largest uh, EHR. Uh,
some of the difficulties with wireless technology. <laughs> um, as a practicing physician, I think some of the biggest obstacles that stand in the way of us actually using the data that's collected globally is the law and actually reimbursement. Um, and I think those are the, the two biggest stumbling blocks. Uh, at the current time, for you just to pick up your cell phone and text me is impossible to do. Um, although patients do it all the time, and we will share publicly that we do respond to that, and we do answer those requests, and I've got photos of back and forth um, to deliver care to my patients, and I'm comfortable with that. But within the context of the current law, that's not possible. Um, I think a lot of the electronic health records are pushing forward on that, and you'll see applications like my chart that you can use on your mobile device that can communicate with us, and that suddenly then makes it legal for me to use this information. So those of us that are sort of worried about the medical legal climate here in the U.S. are going to shy away from some of this mobile data at the start. I think the other is the reimbursement issue, that right now most insurance covers a face-to-face -face interaction with the doctor in the office and not the sharing of information through mobile technologies, even through uh, some of the telehealth technologies. We've been fortunate in the state of California that in 2012, AB 415 was passed that for government payers said that we could go ahead and bill just as if we did for face-to-face -face interaction for the telehealth. So suddenly that opened up to 50% of our population the ability to use telehealth and for the physician to be reimbursed or broke down one of those stumbling blocks. Um, we found subsequent to that as we started to submit bills to even private payers, so goes the government, so goes the private payers. We're starting to get reimbursed for that as well. And I think as we start to, to break down these barriers, you'll find that the use of mobile technologies, mobile information that is transmitted to the physician will be more and more accepted. But until we work with HHS to, to, to sort of change these laws, um, things are going to be difficult. Uh, uh, the technology has far outstripped the ability to use it practically within medicine. that one of the uh, challenge really for the uh, mo mo uh, health IT, as, uh, particularly mobile health probably, that uh, it is a big challenge to get really developers to work in this field. Uh, I just want to hear uh, uh, from the startup to see uh, your experience of, about you know, getting talents, uh, you know, engineering talents and other talents from the, from the other Glorious uh, consumer internet uh, you know, space into, into the healthcare space. Uh, Michelle, could you just? Sure, that's a really funny question, actually. So I'm a dermatology resident, and I mostly study all the time. And I met this woman, lovely, incredible person, in Best Hope, who's helped me. And I realized medicine was going to definitely go mobile, and I wanted to help be, I wanted to be a part of that, usher that. And so she said, you know, go to a hackathon. And so there I was at hackathon. And it was hilarious, but actually, you know, I learned a lot. I realized through this process, I ended up recruiting incredible engineers who were motivated by the idea that they too wanted to access healthcare in a more efficient way in the future. I think that there's motivation in the talent pool because the problem they see is more meaningful than building the next game. So one of my iOS developer is a fellow who built many games, including Farmville. Um, and so I think that it's really motivated by their desire to give back, but it's hard. I mean, I have to go in and really try to meet people face to face in different groups that I never really interface with, but I've learned a lot um, in vocal development and development. Your turnaround time on what you've built and response and feedback in that is much faster than in medicine. I'll see a patient, I won't see them back for three months. I don't know during that time how my treatment really impacted them. Whereas what we've done with mobile is we'll develop a new feature and within days we'll have feedback from our data users or patients about the experience. And it's made me actually realize that one of the key things about mobile health that's going to be great 
is the ability to have a faster uh, sense of what your treatment is doing and how it's impacting someone. That, that's somewhat tangential to the question. Really, the developer question is go to half thumbs, meet people, get great advisors, and be willing to really branch out for the community and character. Okay, that's great. Abby, do you have anything to share? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Michelle. Uh, but I also want to add that um, a lot of um, developers also sort of know that healthcare is going to be one of the largest industries in the next two decades of their life growth. There are a lot of healthcare IT jobs that are healthcare IT people. So if they get in early now, uh, even if it's a startup and maybe you know, their pay is not what they want, uh, but they're learning and they're at the forefront. And I think that's really important. I think that's been one of the ways we've been able to recruit people. Um, but just uh, for, for ethics and giggles, so we are recruiting for our CTO. We um, had 12 very high quality candidates, and then we ended up um, doing sort of projects with three to sort of see if we had the right chemistry and if they could really deliver on what um, they said uh, they would be able to. We built down to two, both great, uh, one from, you know, Stanford, from Duke, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, um, we, found, we, found, uh, we found the right person, and he's actually the couple of exits, so, uh, and has raised money and everything, so it was, uh, it was, I guess, a pretty lucky process, but you really got to look, you got to uh, really put yourself out there, you know, it'll take you four to six months to find the right fit, it's a high level position, and kind of maybe like three months to, you know, um, find, you know, all right, thank you. Uh, now, let us let's open up to the floor to uh, ask questions. Uh, David? Hi, Dave. Uh, Dave Schneider, uh, 42 Tech, and organizer of uh, SharePoint. Uh, as well as a few other technologies. 
Uh, and I remember, I think it was last year at FEMED, there was a company called Uchem, basically declared they're going to change the world by transforming every single uh, cell phone we have into a mobile point of diagnostic device. So, you know, after we sit through the hype, we basically realize they're trying to do a real analysis on the phone and they did not have FDA clearance. And when they realized they finally had to go through FDA clearance, they uh, basically shared with the innovation community they had no money. So they went to Kickstarter, um, where one, the, uh, the, the crowdsourcing platform to raise money. So without, I hate to use the word regulation, but without guidance and governance, I think what we'll end up seeing is a lot of technology. They're not really um, sort of as thoughtful uh, and as cost effective. There are also a lot of technology that came out a year ago that were designed to work exclusively with the older uh, Apple architecture. Now, once Apple changes the connector, all your medical device and sensor needs to be upgraded. So you as a consumer end up having to buy new technology. So I think the value of the guidance and regulation is to ensure an absolute degree that we as a healthcare industry can provide a more effective, secure, and safer solution to our members. And patients. So hopefully, FDA can uh, can speed up their process. <laughs> Any other question? I just wanted to add, but um, it's definitely a great area. Um, from a health product perspective, we don't um, provide medical advice or diagnosis, and so that sort of keeps us in a care, uh, at least for now. And I'm sure a lot of other companies that have uh, taken the uh, opposition as well just to not have to uh, deal with these uncertain things. I think the only thing I would have to add would be to second that about the glacial case in which the FDA moves for the approval of these devices. Um, oftentimes we're sitting in interactions with patients um, wanting to use a particular device. And, uh, our telehealth partnership is with Cisco for the pilot, and we have a weekly meeting. We go back to the meeting and say, I need this. And they say, well, it's on the shelf. It's so waiting for FDA approval. And it's that slow process that keeps us from finding these things. So uh, we definitely need Faster process, but it also needs to be sure that it's safe as well. Maybe just a quick comment, not from an FDA perspective, but just from our own experience. Cisco is a technology company used to provide horizontal products to all industry. We never saw about FDA before, but when we try to use our telepresence or video conferencing in telehealth, then this is a big issue for us. So we really went through uh, all those process to see. But in the end, we find, of course, we really look forward to the FDA new guidance. But no matter what, as a company, as a technology company, we also need to be ready for that. That's why a few years ago, we proactively set up our own uh, regulation or regulatory uh, framework. You need to really have a quality assurance uh, policy, you have a governance. How do you do the recall? So in them days, when we have our health presence classified as a class one medical device, we have all those things in place. So when FDA came to the inspection, we are ready. So I think that that's the only comment I just want to make here. All right, that's great. Only if we have a lot of money, yeah, that, will, that could be an uh, issue with startups. Uh, let's see, are there any more questions on the floor? So I'm from a background actually uh, related to bad technology. So as many of you might already know, the DNA sequencing is becoming uh, really advanced. You can sequence because the whole DNA, whole genome, within uh, a few hours, you know, within like a few thousand dollars. In the past, it's like uh, you have to spend in the tens of thousands, millions of thousands, millions of dollars to sequence a whole genome. So in a year like this, you know, we will start to see, you know, once you have a DNA sequence, you generate a terabyte of data. So how will those data be analyzed and how the mobile health, the mobile virus technology can help uh, in that paradigm, you know, help transfer those data, analyze those data, and deliver those data to the patient and to the doctor. 
the mathematical professions. Okay, uh, anybody want to see this here? <laughs> so, I think this is right. I think by definition and by Dr. Eric Topo's definition, digital health includes uh, the advancement of uh, genomics technology uh, in combination with mobile health, telemedicine, and other to create a new model of care. So I think uh, right now uh, our KB research team is conducting one of the world world largest uh, genomic um, research projects. I think from my perspective, the, the data again, from science to scientist perspective, there's a lot of value in terms of understanding the, the patterns and anomaly. But again, in terms of consumerization of healthcare, you as a consumer need to make sure that data is actually uh, actionable. So data is translating in such a way. Uh, uh, including the UI UX to actually help you understand how does the information impact your uh, your family, yourself. And I often talk about technology uh, needing to be uh, unobtrusive and also motivational. So at the end of the day, what we want to do is call to action, right? Use the information, the genomic information, your clinical data, as well as other uh, information such as where you live, uh, geolocation, uh, to really come up with a set of recommendations that can help us move the needle. Uh, in the day, we want to change behaviors. I'm a big fan of Dr. Uh, uh, B.J. Fox's uh, philosophy of you know behavior model. Right, behavior change will only take place if you're personally motivated, you're physically or financially able, and nothing is that little nudge or trigger. So I think information such as genomics data. Uh, and others can help us create that trigger to help you better understand about yourself, your family, your history, your environment, and with that, I think we have an opportunity to actually come up with some uh, uh, preventive and corrective actions to deliver what I call the value medicine in here. Yeah, I think you raised such a great point because I've been the patient is actually in a really unique position, um, particularly with genomic data to actually help us understand health better. So, for example, the more genomic data that we have here with clinical information, um, then the better insight, the better insights we can provide. And so patients kind of donating or understanding that their genomic data may actually be used for research purposes to further derive actionable insights I think is really important. And essentially making that data accessible in the cloud in a secure way so that can be paired with clinical development information is essential for us to not only say what's important for you, but to provide new insights from what might be, you know, right now to some extent um, unclear where the true value is, but certainly we'll get there. So I, I agree with you on the behavior change, those pieces, I think the genomic data will have a particular role, but the other extreme is also for some of the most difficult disease, especially like in children's space, that travel melanoma, those cases, you don't have a traditional way of a treatment. So I also see a trend uh, in the near term, how do you leverage the personalized genomic sequencing and combine that with the clinical data. So there is a, a lot of organization now really doing this as a clinical trial way right, to focus on those difficult disease, bring oncologists and many other Physician together, they run at a virtual tumor ball using the genomic sequence for the combination of different treatment plans to deal with that. And I think that will have some kind of uh, early impacts for the next three or five years. Thank you. Uh, oh, we're doing this time. Okay. Uh, well, uh, some time, so let, let's, let's uh, let me give just uh, every now is a, a just a more common sentence uh, for for the you know uh, wisdom. Just being able to actually provide care to our patients. Perfect storm right now with healthcare, um, for, uh, healthcare reform, higher expectation of consumers. And I think this is where we have an opportunity to use mobile technology to create some different health access points, retail, on-site clinics, telemedicine. So looking forward to uh, working and uh, collaborating with everyone. So in terms of messaging, it's worth noting that Aetna first started doing messaging to members in 2006. It is now 2013. And 
payments are finally ready. So we were excited to see that, that the pays accelerated the past year. In other words, it was going to be rapid feedback loops. I think you need to have physicians, patients, and developers talking to each other in order to affect the device and make them very relevant for uh, care. All right, now let's all stand at the panel.